Welcome to Spectrum with your host, William S. Trebell. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spectrum. I'm your host, William S. Trebell. My guest tonight is Dr. Aubrey de Grey. Hello, sir. Hello, William. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, I've, I'm very excited about this. I, I've been following you since, oh, wow, 2007, I guess, when I first became aware of your work. Well, it's, in that case, it's outrageous that you've taken so long to invite me along. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, sir. And honestly, I didn't have a radio show until October. <laughs> In that case, you're forgiven. Anyway, let's go for it. Yes, sir. Well, um, well, let's start with, can you explain to the listeners what you do and, and what you have been doing these years? Sure. I think the simplest way to do it in a real soundbite is that I view aging as a medical problem. In fact, I think it's insane that most people seem not to view aging as a medical problem. Because at the end of the day, aging is bad for you. Older people tend to be less healthy than younger people. And I would like to fix that. And what I do and what Sense Research Foundation, the organization that is being created around my work does, is exactly that. We are a charity, a 501c3, which is doing biomedical research to develop medicines to stop people from getting less healthy as they get older. Right. And um, I have done my research. A lot of these things um, are a little beyond me. I'll have to tell you, um, I'm not studied too much. in. I, I guess it's uh, the biometrics of, of the human body and, and uh, all these things. But can you tell me about the seven deadly things? Sure. So the big breakthrough that I made about 14 years ago, which allowed me to construct a really solid plan, a really you know, detailed plan for how to defeat aging was because I realized how we could break the problem down into a relatively manageable number of sub problems or small problems. And when I say small, I mean, of course, relatively small, they're still really big problems. Um, the way that we do this is just seven sub problems types of damage, types of cellular or molecular changes that occur in the body over the course of the lifespan, and which occur, first of all, as an inevitable, absolutely, absolutely unavoidable side effect of the way that the body normally works. And second of all, as they accumulate over time, eventually they get to exceed the tolerance of the body, the ability that the body has to, to work around them. So that's when the diseases and disabilities of old age emerge. I see. And we, we have cell, cells in our body that as we grow old, they either die or um, I guess they age themselves, right? And I think I read you were saying that that is preventable or that they are at least replaceable. As, as they do uh, fall off or die or, or whatever it is? Well, that's part of it, but it's a bit more complicated than that. I'm sure. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. In, in fact, the, the, the phenomenon that you just described is just one of the seven things that we focus on. Right. What you just described was cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. And that is certainly a big part of aging, but it's only one part. There are six other parts that are just as important and which are not like that. Two of the other parts are actually to do with cells, have, having too many cells rather than having too few. Uh -huh. that, can, that can happen either because cells are dividing when they're not supposed to, or because cells are not dying when they are supposed to. And it turns out that both of those things matter. So that makes, so rather than just one type of problem with aging, namely self dying, you've got now three problems. It turns out that actually there are four more problems, which are not at the cellular level uh, in terms of how many cells we have, 
but rather at the subcellular level, the molecular level. And those problems occur, some of them inside cells, some of them actually not even inside cells, but actually outside cells in the spaces between cells in the material that holds our organs and tissues together. I see. Okay. And, and, um, and also this has to do with uh, our, our proteins. And I, I was reading about stem cells and the application thereof. Right. So stem cell therapy is actually the basic way that we think is the right way to focus on one of these seven types of damage. And the type of damage that we're talking about is that very first one that you mentioned, namely cells dying and not being automatically replaced by cell division in the body. Okay. What stem cell therapy is all about is putting cells into the body with medicine that will divide and change, transmogrify into a form that replaces the cells that the body was not replacing on its own. But again, that's just one of the seven types of damage. Okay, and also, like you were saying too, in the other three or four, the uh, the things that uh, either multiply on their own that shouldn't, or uh, I, I think I saw once you, you termed them as cellular garbage. Am I still on the right? Uh, the garbage aspect is actually relating to two of the molecular parts, the parts that happen inside and outside the cell. So that's not to do with cell number, that's to do with cell constituents. Okay. And for someone like me, like I don't practice, uh, uh, I, I don't have a healthy diet. Let's say um, I eat the wrong foods and, and all these things. Does this have, is this applicable? Does it hinder what, what you're talking about could be done? So that's a great question. It's really <laughs> Thank you. It's really important for people to know what they should do today to help themselves to live longer, to stay healthy for longer. Right. And I want to give two answers to that question. I want you and your, and your listeners to listen to really closely to both of these answers. The first answer is people need to understand what aging really is. And people don't understand that. People think of the diseases of old age, like Alzheimer's or cancer or cardiovascular disease. They think of those as bad things but they don't understand that those diseases are parts of aging. They're side effects of being alive in the first place. And if we understood that better, when I say we here, of course, I'm talking about policymakers, I'm talking about people who are in charge of funding and so on. Right. If we understood that better, then we would be much more in tune with the biology. The fact is that the biology has been telling us for decades that we need to be putting more money into treating the precursors of those diseases. The phenomenon of aging itself, which is the accumulation of damage to the body, which is harmless for a long time, but eventually causes these diseases. Treating the symptoms of these diseases, whether it be cancer or Alzheimer's or anything, is never going to be effective. You've got to treat the causes, and the causes are the side effects of the being alive in the first place, of the way the body normally works. That's what this is really all about. Right. So that's the first thing I want to tell people who are listening to this. The second thing I want to tell people is, how can you help yourself? Now, some people listening to this broadcast may be 70 or 80 years old already. And you guys may be thinking to yourselves, well, okay, this is all like medical research. It may benefit people in the future, but it's not going to benefit me. Right. And I sympathize with that, that perspective. But the fact is, first of all, most of you guys who are 70 or 80 or more, you've got kids. I presume you care about your kids, right? So if you can do something to increase the chances that those people, your kids, can actually benefit from improved medicine, then you should do it, right? right. And the way to improve that probability is to hasten the advances, to make those advances happen sooner. 
that's what I'm all about. I'm all about making these advances happen sooner. That's what I'm all about. I see. So for, for the average Joe out there, we'll say, and um, like I said, uh, you like to eat some bacon, uh, have a drink here and there, and, and these kind of things, should we be worried about calorie restrictions and eating very, very healthy and, and trying to um, do, do these things prevent the damages, extend our lives, and, and should w do those affect the, uh, the, the end outcome of what you're proposing we are a would be able to do if we, we all focused, uh, science focused in that direction? Right, so this is a great question and a really important one. And the answer comes down to numbers. The answer, the qualitative answer to your question is yes, it's better to live a healthy life. To right. do best as, we, as best as good as we can to live healthier for longer by you know, eating right and, and exercising right and so on. But there's also a quantitative aspect. The question we have to ask is how much extra healthy life, life expectancy can we gain by doing the right thing, by eating right, by exercising and so on. And unfortunately, the answer is very, very miserable. <laughs> the answer is that we can only gain a couple of years at most that kind of way, whatever we do. You know, it's really important to understand that. A lot of people, you know, I, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm from the rest of the world. I'm from England. And a lot of people in the rest of the world laugh at America because America spends far more per person on health care than any other country in the whole world. And right. yet, your life expectancy is really low on the league table. It's like you're number 30 or 40 or something like that. Right. It's it looks ridiculous, but, 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 here's the point. If you look at the actual numbers, what your life expectancy is, and you compare it with what the life expectancy of Japan is, they're the number one country, out of the, out of the big countries anyway, then the difference between those numbers is tiny. It's only about four years. I see. Only four years. So it's actually completely wrong for people to be thinking about improving their diet or their exercise regimen or everything. It's entirely fine that people think in terms of quality versus quantity. You know, they'll, they'd like to eat this or that, even if it's a little bit bad for them, because it's only a really, really little bit bad for them. I see. So what, the, what, what does this actually mean for what you should do? What I've just, what I've just told you what, is what doesn't really matter very much. I'm not saying it doesn't matter at all. It certainly matters. Every month of extra healthy life is a very valuable thing. I'm not saying, no, don't bother to eat healthily. I'm right. just saying have a sense of proportion about it. So yeah. the question, what is the bigger thing that you can do? And the bigger thing is hasten what we're doing. Hasten, do what you can to accelerate the development of therapies that are better than anything we have today. That's what it's all about. So when I'm frivolous, I just say the right thing you can do today to improve your chance, your like your healthy life expectancy is to give me large amounts of money. <laughs> Very That's good. Not completely frivolous. Because the fact is, we are doing the best work. Right, right. And and uh, uh, speaking of that, support. Do you, are you finding it? Um, like you mentioned, policymakers. I guess uh, the bench scientists. You know, do you find detractors amongst those to be having self-serving interests? Maybe the medical industry, for example. Do you find it hard to uh, reach the mainstream working scientists, the the policymakers, the governments? Sure, of course. I mean, you know, vested interests, are, uh, uh, it, it's just like any other situation. It's actually pretty extreme in, 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 this, in this particular area. But yeah, sure, there are vested interests everywhere. 
So, of course, there are lots of spurious arguments used to try to denigrate what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is pretty damned obvious, really, if you pay attention. Right, right. Yo, know, it, it makes sense to me, and I, I'm a total, I'm totally lay on on these subjects. So, you know, a lot of it is things that I, and I guess the the average fellow isn't totally versed in. But um, I've been reading, and I've been, I've seen, I've seen the documentaries that you've been a part of, and uh, I, it makes sense to me somehow. And uh, I've seen the um, the research done. W weren't you years ago? They were offering a uh, a reward for anybody who could extend double the life of a mouse, for example. We're still offering that reward, in fact. So no yeah. one's no one's uh, been able to. Well, not yet. But what you're actually referring to is something actually on the other side. The reward that was offered was for any scientists who could convince a neutral panel of experts that what we were saying was unscientific. I see. And that didn't happen. Okay. Various people submitted entries saying not terribly well-informed things, shall we say, and sure enough, they were summarily uh, rejected. So it's it looked pretty good. You know, at this point, it's pretty clear that what we've been putting forward is scientifically well-grounded and has a good chance of actually succeeding. Of course, it's only a chance. We always emphasize that even though we think we have a 50-50 chance of bringing this home within the next 20 or 25 years, there's at least a 10% chance that we won't get there for 100 years because it's, you know, it's really pioneering technology. Just right. like any other pioneering technology, we have no idea what new problems we're going to encounter as time goes on. But a 50% chance is quite enough to be worth fighting for. Absolutely. And a lot of this, again, it's, it's theoretical. And... Um... In in the in the last few years, have you have you been able to uh, have any of these? Have you have you ever have you made any progress in uh, bringing it into the lab, testing theories, bringing anything to uh, fruition? Let's say. Oh yeah, very cool. We have spent most of our money on exactly that. So, Science Research Foundation consists. It, it's we're a five hundred one c three a charity, and. We spend perhaps 80% of our money on actual lab research. Uh -huh. um, the, 20, the other 20% goes on outreach, you know, on, 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 on getting the word out, education. Um, but yeah, absolutely. We have a facility in California, in the South Bay, Mountain View, uh, where we have a few thousand square feet of lab space doing three of our projects. That accounts for perhaps one third of our research budget. The other two thirds goes on experiments done, in, uh, uh, projects done in university labs around the world. Most of those are in the US, some of them are elsewhere. Uh, there are more than a dozen of those now. And absolutely, we are putting our money where our mouth is. We are getting that work done. We prioritize projects that are being neglected by other people, that other people feel are, you know, too speculative, too early stage and so on. We, essentially what we're doing is we are taking advantage of the fact that we are funded by philanthropy. I see. Funded by industry, or if you're funded by the government, then you have a different mindset. You have a different situation. It's more short-termist. We don't do short-termism. We work on the things that other people can't work on. Right. Well, uh, let's take a small break, and we'll be back to hear more from Dr. Aubrey de Grey. Welcome back to Spectrum. If you're just joining me tonight, I'm your host, Willie Vestrebell, and my guest tonight is Dr. Aubrey de Grey, and I think fittingly so, we just heard Who Wants to Live Forever by Queen. 
And we have been talking about immortality, or if not immortality, at least advanced life, uh, longer life, maybe even indefinite lifespans for, for the human. I find this very interesting, and, and like in that little song by Queen, I've heard some of your detractors say things about like uh, living forever and the calamity that might cause to uh, mankind. And of course, I have a bunch of hobbies. I think, I think I'd be good for a few hundred years and, and stay occupied and stay interested, you know? But um, you have addressed that question about like, it, obviously if, if powerful men and, and uh, you know, our, our great minds did live a long time, the impact it would have on our societies, well, obviously we'd have to sort of rewrite our guidebook, wouldn't we? Just a little. I think that's a great way of putting it. Yes, we would have to rewrite our guidebook completely. Okay. Because essentially, all of our guidebook, certainly 90% of it, right. is built uh, on the assumption of a particular longevity. Absolutely. Okay. There is a general assumption that at a particular age, people start to go downhill and they need to be replaced by younger people who can do the same thing or can, can succeed them in one way or another. And that is going to change. Now, the question is, if we have, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, so what? Now, is that a problem? Is that, a, is that something we need to fear? Right. Of course, we're, this is not a new problem. This is not a new question. If we go back to the Industrial Revolution, it was exactly the same deal. A massive transition in how people were spending their time. And we have to ask ourselves, we, uh, you know, just as we did then, we, have to, we had to ask ourselves, how will this work? But of course, the point is very clear. The really fundamental point is that we are not being required to do anything. Rather, we are being given the opportunity to do something. Right. So, um, you know, new technology is, in, is enhancing our options. So just so long as we figure out how to optimize what to do within the context of the new options available, we are bound to be doing better than we were before. That's all, that's all we need to remember. Okay. So, we, so the right thing to do right now, when we think about the prospect of a post-aging world, is simply to look back at the Industrial Revolution and to acknowledge that, yes, it was a turbulent transition, sure, but the fact is it was a valuable transition. Nobody wants to go back to a pre-industrial world and it's going to be exactly the same this time. I see. And, and what about population? So the fear of overpopulation is just one example of the fears that people have. It's, I, I really want to emphasize, first of all, that it's just one example. It's just the first thing that, people, that occurs to people. Right, right. But still, we need to address it. I'm not saying we don't. The question is how we address it. I would say that looking forward from now on the basis of what we know today, there are quite a few options. The first one is, well, it may not be an option. It may not be a problem at all because fertility rates are coming down and people are having their children later and so on. And secondly, because the carrying capacity of the planet is increasing over time as technology improves. For example, as we improve the use of, um, of renewable energy and in the future nuclear fusion, we will be using less carbon, right. less fossil fuels. And so that will reduce our carbon footprint and that will allow more people to exist on the planet with less environmental impact. Now that's true, of course, also for other pollutants. So that's a really important thing to take into account. Yeah, well, it's obviously a very deep subject, very, very deep subject. And obviously, since uh, I've become aware of you, you've made many strides forward. You've uh, opened 
like you're talking about the uh, the places the research has been moving forward and again you've had to uh, you've had to sort of be outside the mainstream the the bench science and I'm sure that has an effect on progress and and uh, time tables and everything well kind of I mean of course I've chosen my roots you know I right uh, training in Ben Sands, but what I've been able to do is create a movement, you know, foment a movement, I guess, um, that has brought people in who have abundant training. So at our lab in Mountain View, we have half a dozen scientists who have absolutely classical training in doing bench science, and they're damn good at it, and that's why they are moving this work forward. We right. are doing. We're we're not we're not a bunch of amateurs. Right. We are, absolutely. We are doing real science. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I've I've been following you, and I'm very interested in it. And um, I've been trying to keep up with those things that that affect your the the concepts and, and your um, movement forward, like uh, stem cell research, and you know the. Uh, the difficulties that's had the laws have just recently changed a lot of places they've been able to find their stem cells in other ways right like they are creating those from scratch they're making them from what was it uh, are, are we not getting them now from mice and and we're just creating them from scratch right so, 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 well okay it would take me a while to correct all the <laughs> efforts, but, um, but, but broadly speaking what you're saying is true yeah so okay. <laughs> that is going really well. And all the other areas that we work in are also going really well. So, I mean, you know, the, the people that work in our lab and the people that we fund, they're all, you know, very people. They, you know, they're post postdoctoral people with PhDs who have a very clear idea how to do what they're doing. And that's why they're making progress. You know, we are publishing stuff. Uh, we had a publication just accepted last weekend uh, in the Journal of Biological Chemistry, which is one of the most respected publications in the entire world in uh, biology. And, you know, it's it's a big deal. We are really getting getting stuff done. Very cool. I'm excited about it, and I would hope to see this happen. I am one of the folks who would uh, I would enjoy an extended life. Absolutely. Of course, these ideas also, um, it takes away cancers and diabetes and, and these things that are um, so prevalent in, in our modern uh, life cycles, right? I mean, not, it's not just a, a side effect, I'm saying, but it is something that like even it, it is affecting those things, right? Like this could be the end of diabetes. L let me put it really clearly. Okay. Every single disease that we have that predominantly affects people who were born a long time ago is a disease of aging. Right. And diseases of aging are not distinct from anything that you may think of as aging itself. There is no such thing as aging itself. Aging is the ill health of old age. So every disease that we have that dominantly affects people who were born a long time ago is part and parcel of aging. The big, big problem that we have today is that most people don't understand what I just said. Most people think that aging is some kind of process separate from disease. It isn't. I it's see. part and parcel of disease. Okay. It is absolutely inseparable from disease. So, treating aging is synonymous with preventative medicine for, for the diseases of old age. That's the entire message that I want your audience to go away with. I get it. Early on, you used a uh, a, a descriptive of uh, of an old car, an antique, a vintage automobile, and how uh, they're made to last a certain amount of time, but uh, it's preventative. And I, I think that was that was a very good 
way to say it for us lay people who well don't... let me come back to that analogy a little bit okay because that analogy was a way of transmitting a somewhat different message oh the message that i was transmitting a moment ago was that the diseases of old age need to be regarded as part and parcel of aging there is no difference between the two the thing with the car that you just mentioned is with regard to intervention against that process. And in particular, the argument that the maintenance approach attacking the lifelong, initially harmless, accumulating damage of aging, the side effects of being alive, is going to be the most efficient, the most effective, the most promising way to postpone the ill health that arises from having too much of that damage. All right, well, let's have another break, and uh, we'll be back to hear more from Dr. Aubrey de Grey. Welcome back to Spectrum, and I'm your host, William S. Trebell, and my guest tonight is Dr. Aubrey de Grey, and we have been talking about extending life and um, uh, maybe immortality for, for us people. And uh, it's it's wonderful. And I thank you, sir, for being patient with me and my, my knowledge of this. Like I said, is rather limited. I think we're all learning. So can you tell me, can you tell us more about like uh, what we can do and how how we should uh, like I want I want people to become aware of your work. OK, so here's the thing I really want to say. Mm -hmm. to everybody who's listening who doesn't know much biology but who understands that aging is quite bad for you and we'd like it not to be so bad for you. The basic thing I want to say is for the past several thousand years since civilization, since humanity discovered that aging was a phenomenon, that aging existed, and that it was bad for you, we have been paralyzed by it. If we look back a century ago, certainly two centuries ago, but even one century ago, we can say the same thing about cancer. Cancer was something that people didn't like to talk about. Right. And, of course, it wasn't understood. Right. It was right. the understanding of cancer was was retarded, was slowed down, was slowed down by people's reluctance to talk about it. But eventually people understood that cancer was a disease. Cancer right. was something that we might, in principle, be able to develop medicine against. And we are still a long way away from really bringing cancer under control, but at least we're trying. We're a, a hell of a lot closer than we used to be. Everybody, I want all, everyone who's listening to this broadcast to feel that way about aging. I want everybody to understand that it's the same thing. Aging is a medical problem. It doesn't matter whether you call it a disease or not, it's still a medical problem. And I want people to understand that not only is it a medical problem, but also it's a medical problem that people are working very productively to address. I, in particular, have figured out how to address it. Right. And the foundation that's been created around my work is plowing forward as fast as we can to bring that to the clinic. Unfortunately, as fast as we can is currently limited by funding. You know, I can't deny it. The fact is we could be going perhaps three times faster if we had better money. And right. that's a lot of money. That's a lot of speed. That's a lot of lives that are being lost because we're not going as fast as the science could allow us to do. Right. Again, it's hard to get the, the big funders, I guess, the uh, the universities, the uh, 
the medical industry, you would think they would be interested in. Um, well, I, 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 well, thank you for mentioning that, because that's actually a really important point. There are three places, three types of source of funding for this kind of research. One of them is industry. Yes. But actually, it's not a good source right now because most of the stuff that needs to be done is really early stage. It's really long term work. And your typical investor wants to make money quickly. They're not going to be interested in something that long term. We, you know, we, we're trying to change that, but that's the reality that we need to work with. Right. Then the second type of source of funding is the government, you know, the National Institute of Health and so on. Unfortunately, they also have a short termism problem, which is that they don't have nearly an, as much money as they need to fund the very, very good academic research that applies for their money. So they tend to focus on what we like to call low risk, low gain work and not high-risk, high-gain high work. We are definitely doing high-risk, high-gain work. We're doing ambitious stuff, stuff that will not necessarily you know, give, give deliverables in a well-defined time frame. And we are proud that we are doing that because ultimately that's how progress is made. It's by taking those risks. Right. But what it ultimately comes down to is that the government is also a very unpromising source of funding for this work. So then we have to ask, you know, okay, if it's not coming from industry, it's also not coming from government, where is it coming from? And of course the answer is, it's coming from you. It's coming from philanthropy. Right. That's really, it's all about philanthropy, it's all about donations. Sense Research Foundation has existed for the past five years. Made before that, the Methuselah Foundation for another five years or more. Entirely because people get it. And people, in particular, people whose money is not beholden to other people. I see. Yeah. And it's ultimately all about getting re-elected. You know? Mm -hmm. the, the, Companies who make decisions are satisfying their shareholders. Yes. It's only, it's only philanthropy that doesn't have an electorate. So that's really important to us. We need to get to understand our mission well enough to contribute. And of course, very wealthy people can contribute more than less wealthy people. But everybody knows that it doesn't work like that. No. Right. There is this thing called the long tail, right? And that large numbers of people with small amounts of wealth can seriously dominate what actually happens. That's what we want to, to make happen. I see. And in the end, when this does find fruition, as it were, it, it isn't something that would just be uh, governed by said wealthy people and, and the power uh, elite, as it were, it will affect us all, will it not? Like, we will all have access to the uh, the newfound knowledge and ability. Absolutely. So we, as a 501c3 charity, public charity, we have absolutely no idea who will control this technology in the end. But what we can say is a very clear thing, that this technology will affect everybody, and therefore, it will affect what people vote for. You know, I, I'm always brought back to the famous Clinton aphorism, it's the economy, stupid, right? Right. Now, why is it, is it the economy stupid? The reason is because that's what most people care about the most. In the aggregate, they care about how much they have in their bank account. Right. But there are certain things that transcend that, and their health is the number one thing. So when there is technology available in principle that 
enhances people's health, it's going to matter even more than the economy. Absolutely. And that means that even in a really tax-averse society like the USA, you are going to end up with this being provided to everybody who is old enough to need it. Hmm. I come from the old world, from the UK. And I obviously, as everyone listening will understand, I regard the USA as fundamentally crazy. <laughs> you, know, right? um, you know, that it's insane that you have such a tax averse attitude. We right. will have with taxes. Um, but that's not the point. Right. I do not want your audience to go away with the feeling that, oh, this guy is saying this because he's from the UK. The fact is, even from a US perspective, what I'm saying stands up. Sure. We are going to want this to be available to everybody. And this is not just from a humanitarian perspective, it's from an economic perspective. Right. If you don't do this, the alternative is to let poor older people get sick and to pay to keep them alive when they're sick. And right. that is going to cost more than it would have done to stop them from getting sick in the first place. All right. Well, now, uh, on, a, on a lighter note, uh, something I was wanting to ask you about. Uh, can you tell me about punting? <laughs> <laughs> Be about fantasy. So, <laughs> so, so, there is this thing called the punt in American football, as I'm so I'm told. Right. But that's not what I do. Right. In the, in England, in particular in Cambridge and uh, and Oxford and one or two other places in England, there are these boats that you can um, transport up and down the river, and the way in which you do it is by using a pole to push against the bottom of the river. And it sounds really clunky and weird and like, why would anyone want to do it? But it turns out that it's very relaxing and romantic and so on. And I happen to be extremely good at it. Right. Um, right. So, uh, well, you know, that's all I can say. <laughs> no, I was, I was very curious about that. And of course, you know, with the Google, I was looking into punting, and on, on this side of the pond, as it were, that's the first thing you get is, I think it's in football, I'm not big on sports, but there is something called the punt, and um, a sports thing, and uh, it took me a while to find anything about the boat, and I, I did find it very interesting, and I saw these images of uh, the men in Cambridge, and they're uh, negotiating each other and, and these waterways, and I, I did find it a little fascinating. I did, and I could see how that might be um, relaxing and, and uh, very interesting. Yeah, you probably didn't see any actual videos of the really relaxing part. Oh, I, I'm sure, I'm sure. And, um, you know, like, uh, that's that's another thing. People can see you, and you've done uh, many documentaries, and I guess the easiest way would be to look up your name and find um, your in internet movie database that lists all of the documentaries you've been in and I don't know how many of them uh, but uh, I've seen at least one where you are punting I've seen I've certainly done a lot of punting on, on camera yes 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 all right and to uh, what you were talking about the Methuselah Foundation people can find that online and your 503 is also they can they can find it and anybody that wants to donate I'm, I'm sure they go there well kind of so, so um, let me clarify that so the foundation that I originally created back in 2003, the Methuselah Foundation, is indeed a 501c3 based in Virginia. And we originally created it as a way to raise the profile of longevity research by offering prizes for increasing the world record longevity for much. Right. And that's kind of a like you know a PR exercise. You know, it's 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 kind of a you know it's really a rather narrow, rather superficial thing. But that was fine. That we did a we we're not we're not ashamed of that at all. 
it's like we want to bring people in. We want to get people excited about longevity research. However, we also wanted to do really important research ourselves. And after a few years, we were able to bring enough money in to be able to get that going. And that's what we did. And then a couple of years after that, we decided that it would be best to have the PR exercise, the promotional stuff from the prizes, be separated from the research. So we ended up splitting the foundation in two. And that's why we created Sense Research Foundation. So Sense Research Foundation is the, is, is the organization that I am the chief scientist of, of. And we are funding a whole bunch of different research projects. And the Fusilla Foundation is doing these prizes. I see. So of course, back to the same mission, we both want to bring aging to an end. We want to hasten the, the, medic, the development of medicine that completely dominates aging in the same way that we dominate tuberculosis or diphtheria or whatever. Very but good. it's in different ways. And it seems to be a good thing to be doing this separately. So even though we don't have any overlap of personnel, nevertheless, of course, we certainly talk to each other a lot. Very good. And has is, have I missed anything, sir? Like I said, thank you for your patience with me and my, my woeful misunderstanding and, and lack of knowledge. But have I missed anything that, that's important that you might want to uh, tell us all? So I think you've covered uh, all the bases here. Very cool. Well, and it, it's been it's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, like I said, I've I've been interested in what you were doing for a very long time, and uh, absolute pleasure to speak with you, sir. Likewise, thank you for having me on the show. Well, my guest tonight has been Dr. Aubrey de Grey, and we have been discussing longevity research, and uh, you can find him and and his uh, foundation online and uh, I think I think it's in all our best interest to become aware of his work and you've been listening to Spectrum I'm your host William Esther Bell Join us here on Spectrum with your host, William S. Trebell. Each week, a different guest will join William for a chat on Spectrum.